Hello, everyone. I think we're um, we're ready to start now. So, welcome to this week's market outlook. Um, as usual, we're doing this in a few different ways. Uh, we're doing it on um, YouTube via our YouTube channel, and also um, via Facebook Live and um, via webinars. And for those of you watching via the webinar, that's going to stop at the end of this month. We're just going to do it um, via YouTube and Facebook Live, which is for the risk warning. There's a lot to talk about. So there's, there's a lot going on this week in everything. Uh, stock markets, US markets, um, NASDAQ hit fresh all-time highs yesterday. S&P broke a big level. We'll look at that. Um, the pound has slipped to its worst level in about 10 months. Um, gold has broken down to lows from a year ago. And also, even the cryptocurrencies are moving. So we'll talk about all of that today as we're going through. If you're watching a recorded version of this, though, it was held live on uh, Wednesday, July the 18th at 12.30 in the afternoon. So um, in these, what we try and do, we try and sort of cover all the major markets in, um, in under half an hour. And we do it every Wednesday at 12.30. If you're watching via YouTube, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, you get automatically notified when we go live and also of the regular videos that we upload. We try and upload something every day. I think the last video that went up was one yesterday <clears throat> on um, Bitcoin. There's one going up later on today about stock markets. But I think that risk warning has been up for long enough. I'll just put the contact details up quickly. If you want to find out more about the company, open an account to try things out. If you go to capital.com, any questions after this session, or whenever, drop me an email. My email address is david.jones at capital.com. And you can follow me on Twitter. And on Twitter, it's um, at Jones the Markets. But I think the risk warning has been up for uh, long enough. So let's just flip it over to the trading platform. I thought we'd start with a pound today. Um, yet again, we've seen the last couple of days, this is pound US dollar that we're looking at. We've seen this market nosedive the last couple of days. It's lost almost 300 points this week, the pound against the dollar. It's down off the highs. If we pick up on these highs up here from um, April April this year, it's down almost 10% in the last three months against the US dollar. And it's a combination of things. I mean, the, the, the rumblings, the ongoing rumblings about Brexit, you know, clearly aren't helping confidence towards the pound. And, and just when it looks like things are stabilizing and we're staging a half decent rally, bang, something else happens and the market uh, plunges again. And today what we've had, we've had some, we've had some disappointing economic data today, disappointing if, if people were, were looking for the next interest rate for the UK. So we've had um, the UK inflation data out this morning. And with these things, it's all about expectations. And the market was expecting UK inflation to be about 2.6% year on year. The number came in uh, under 2.5%, 2.4% is where we came in. And it's um, the classic way of, of combating rising inflation is to, is to raise interest rates. And putting interest rates up is normally good for the currency. Expectations were and arguably still are for an interest rate rise in August from the Bank of England. But they did change their mind back in May and it was down to the inflation data. That was a big part of it, that it wasn't as strong as they thought it was going to be. So we've had disappointing in terms of strength inflation data today. So it's led some people to question whether we are going to get that rate rise uh, next month. Either way, um, this, you know, the, 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 the ongoing the government uncertainty, the resignations, all of that combined with worse than expected or lower than expected inflation data isn't really helping um, sentiment towards the pound. So it's interesting here. You know, we are now back to levels. I mean, let me just take this out. You know, it's been a bit of a, I mean, roller coaster is maybe over egging it, but we had through 2017, we had this rise from the pound from about 121. So a pound was worth $1.21, up as high as what, 143 and a bit in April this year. We've given back a whole chunk of these gains. But where it gets interesting again now is where we are. You know, back in October, November last year, we saw this 130 level being quite pivotal for the pound. Admittedly, back then, sentiment was um, 
somewhat different to what it is what it is at the moment but we did see you know buyers step in thinking the pound had uh, had slid too far and lifting the market higher are we going to see the same thing happen again this this is the question at the moment you have to say it's a market that's still you know pretty weak so i wouldn't want to be standing in front of this runaway train at the moment you know whenever it looks like we're going to see stability for the pound we just see the market slide off again so it's going to be a really interesting few days we've got actually tomorrow there's it's a big week for uk data this week but tomorrow we've got uk retail sales data and that's always interesting you know given the state of the high street in the uk how much it contributes to the uk economy you know will that paint a negative picture for the economy which again could raise question marks about the bank of england raising in august anyway 130 is the big level to watch what do we have so far i mean if we're looking we do have this this trend this latest bit of the trend that has still held you know we had a little poke through that trend line on the 9th of july so that was about the beginning of beginning of last week monday of last week but it has held the market lower and we've pushed we've pushed lower again if we were looking to construct some sort of a positive argument from the technicals here you know we could we could point to the rsi down here this is a 14 day rsi goes oversold down here market pushes lower goes oversold again but not quite as oversold okay this is known as bullish divergence when the rsi is uh rising but the market's falling it can be a suggestion that the, the downward momentum is running out of steam and it worked and you know, it worked for about a week and a half until the last the last the last couple of days and arguably we're seeing the same sort of thing again if we had a bit of strength over the next couple of days we'd have divergence left again assuming the rsi is going to stay there you know we've got higher lows on the rsi even though we're seeing lower lows uh in the market so for me it's all about 130 you know let's see see what happens next i mean if that 130 level breaks it was big support going back here going back to october last year it, you know i think the next obvious target is a slide back to the the, the lows from the summer of last year around about 128 so the pounds definitely want to watch just just have a quick look on the hourly to see what it looks like there you go you can see you know the extent of the decline that was these are these are hourly candlesticks we're looking at so what we're looking at here that's um i'm guessing between nine and ten yeah so the data came out at 9 30 today and there you can see uh just how hard hit the market was okay so that, that's pound us dollar okay so it's 130 is the level to watch let's take a look at the euro the euro has been pretty dull euro dollar pretty dull over the last uh what is it now about a month and a half Just zoom it out and nothing's changed nothing's changed from where we were a week ago we just trapped in what is a, a pretty broad sideways range so on the downside 115 has held the market up really well we had this this hard sell-off into it at the end of may the market rallies 300 350 points and sells off again into here 21st of june uh rallies again and we're coming back to it again so you know we're seeing the market whenever the euro is down around 115 we're seeing the buyers come back in so i think this is this is another interesting one you know we are seeing a lot of dollar strength at the moment and we'll have a look at it we'll see it when we have a look at the price of gold but um 115 is a real flaw uh for the euro so let's see what happens i think you know again if 115 breaks it's a pretty major break and there's a lot of fresh air you know down to the sort of 111 112 area um so it's a really pivotal level for the euro so at the moment for me i would be expecting some sort of strength to start creeping in over the next couple of days as we've seen over the last six weeks or so let's see let's see what happens from an rsi point of view I suppose we do have you know bullish divergence going on here we had it back here where the market slipped to a low hits is pretty much the same low but the rsi was a lot higher at the moment the rsi is only just below what 50 percent so it's a bit non-committal but for me it's all about this whole 115 115 feet 50 area at the moment it's trading just above 116 so i think that's one to watch the next couple of days um so there's a couple of the the fx markets let's take a look at um stock markets because i think they're getting interesting again it's um what should we start with Let, let's start with the s p 500. i think if there's only one stock market to watch is this one you know the s p everyone knows the dow the dow jones uh, as a u.s stock market index but the dow you could argue is not particularly representative 
of the US stock market because it's made up of 30 stocks. All right, it's a pretty broad selection of stocks, but it's still only 30 stocks. The S&P 500, uh, much broader mix. As its name implies, 500 shares. Um, so we have a much broader mix of the US stock market. Late March, late, late January, early Feb, volatility exploded. And you know people who got used to markets going up every week, which felt like forever, and, and in terms of low day-to-day -day volatility, you know, suddenly had something of a rude awakening. So this massive plunge going into Feb. And then since then, we've had a market just sort of trying to make its mind up and, and uh, maybe a bit shell-shocked after the sell-off we've had. But over, well, yesterday, we saw this level, this 2800, 2805 level had been a barrier to any rallies. So to the S&P, let's just zoom in a bit. The S&P rallied up to it in Feb, end of Feb, runs out of steam, has another go, middle of March, pulls back to the old lows, <clears throat> pushes back up again, June, uh, and then sells off. So this 2800 has evolved as really tough resistance barrier to break uh, for the S&P 500 until yesterday. So yesterday, what was interesting yesterday, the market did actually open uh, lower. It opens below the previous day's close. But if I can just change it, it spent most of the day uh, just going up. I think I've got some, uh, hang on, I'm not going to click there. I clicked on the wrong thing. Let's have a look. Where is it? Let's zoom it out. Let's go back to the dailies. Okay, so that was that was the open yesterday, below the lows of the previous couple of days. And you can see for the first few hours, just went up. So we've seen a really strong close for the S&P yesterday. Then the question now is, can we continue to hold above 2,800? You know, when, when we get breakouts like this, they can often be the sign that sentiment has shifted. You know, we've got a level that in the past, over the past, what, three, four months now, the market hasn't been able to get through. We've seen sellers come in at these levels. Um, it wasn't the case yesterday. So if we're gonna, if this is a valid break, the next target for these markets, for the S&P 500 and other markets, will be a run back to these old highs. Okay, so um, it's only it's only day one of the break, but it's another interesting one to watch. Even if the market did slide from here, we do still have this trend that's built up since the end of March. So we're three months into this trend. So you could argue, if you look at something like the RSI, it is looking a little bit overheated at these levels, you know, after after the, the strength that we've seen this month so far. So it is arguably, you know, due some sort of slide back. But as long as these old lows hold from 2680 to 2700, um, that trend is is still intact. So, you know, I think however we cut it yesterday was a pretty bullish move by the S&P, uh, the break. While we're on the, the subject of US stocks, look, we'd have a, let's have a quick look at Netflix. I mean, it's it's um, earnings season time again in the US. So when the, the US uh, companies, it started last week when they report the latest set of quarterly figures. So we've got later on today, eBay uh, announcing the last quarter. And then tomorrow we've got Microsoft. Um, so, you know, plenty of earnings data coming out from US companies. <clears throat> um, day before yesterday, after the market had shut, we had Netflix's number. Now, I'm sure Netflix is a company that you're familiar with, uh, the old video streaming company. Incredible performance over well, just, just the last the last few years or so. You know, if we go back, let's go back to, I don't know, back to here. So July 2017, just over a year ago, shares were trading at 180. Yesterday, they closed up at 380. So the share price has doubled over the last year. But uh, Netflix's earnings, um, the disappointing number for the market, they missed their new subscribers target. Now, clearly, new subscribers is pretty important if you're uh, an internet subscription video streaming business. So they missed them by about a million. And you can see the impact, the impact on the shares. Uh, they, they gapped down yesterday. Look at that. That's the big gap. So they closed before the announcement. They closed at 400. And they opened yesterday. At about 345, 347, you know, so that's a what 15% drop on the open. But but look at the comeback, you know, massive comeback. They haven't quite filled that gap, but they haven't filled it by, by a margin. But a really strong move up yesterday, you know, something like a what a 10% bounce back from where they opened. And I thought I thought I'd look at Netflix because it's current, 
because that trend is clearly still up despite the wobbles yesterday. But so much strength in stock markets has been driven by these, these so-called FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. And Google, I think today we've had that news of a $3 billion odd uh, fine for Google, $3.8 billion, pounds, sorry, for its um, illegal Android strategy, apparently. So it'll be interesting to watch Google uh, this afternoon. But these, these tech stocks have really powered the market higher. And I thought it's a good lead in to taking a look at the NASDAQ 100. So the US 100, as it's called on the platform. So it's more of a tech-biased tech, tech biased stock market index, obviously. But again, over the last couple of days, this has pushed out to, to fresh all-time highs. So like the S&P and like other stock markets, it got clobbered late January, early February. But it did actually manage to set fresh all-time high 12th of March, around about then, and it's pushed out again and again. You know, And, and I thought we'd just pick up on this this, this rock solid trend that's been in place the last couple of years. So even if we did get a few days, a few weeks of wobbles, it would take quite a bit of the moment to change that trend. You know, so I think stock markets, because of that move in the S and P yesterday, arguably getting a bit more interesting again because it looks like it's the first step of potentially breaking out of that range it's been trapped in. So stock markets definitely want to watch. Another one that has woken up is Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is, you know, clearly, you know, the moves we saw last year, plenty, I think plenty of people came into trading for the first time last year because of Bitcoin, because it looked like easy money. And it was easy money. It was easy money, you know, from, from September through to um, just before Christmas. So we had, we had three months where um, if you bought Bitcoin and ended up losing money on it, you have been incredibly unlucky you know, because the price went from $3,000 to almost $20,000 in not much more than three months. Clearly, this year has been a somewhat different story. you know. As, and it was a bubble. That, that is a bubble. It doesn't mean it's not going to go to 20000 again. It doesn't mean it's not going to go to 1000 again. You know, but, but that is classic market mania. It's like a speeded up version of the tech bubble from the late 90s. But what's been interesting is the moves we've seen this year. You know, it's got since February, it's been relatively dull compared to the sort of volatility that we were seeing last year. But uh, and I do this this weekly video on our YouTube channel where we look at Bitcoin and um, Ethereum. It's the other one we look at. And what's been interesting has been the big levels. You know how the previous big levels for Bitcoin have stopped various declines and we've been looking at it feels like forever looking at these old lows from november around about five and a half thousand the lows from feb this year at about five thousand nine hundred so to so five and a half to six thousand has been a real pivotal area uh for bitcoin and whenever it's got it's got knocked back it's um you know we've seen buyers come back in and what's interesting is again we've seen the same thing happen again since june of um of last year of this year sorry we've seen the market hold and the last couple of days we've actually seen it push out to its best levels in a month helping this the news flow has really dropped off a cliff when it comes uh to these cryptocurrencies but earlier this week there was news that um blackrock who, who many of you know massive us investment institution offer exchange traded funds etfs on a whole range of markets um have this effectively a working committee looking at the viability of investing into Bitcoin so, or, and other cryptocurrencies. So it's another one of these things that, is it moving to the mainstream? Is it becoming more accepted? And I think that's that's definitely helped lift the price. We've, we've cracked the downtrend. We've broken out through, I think 7,000 was a bit of a barrier. Next barrier, 8,000 is all of it sort of round numbers uh, for Bitcoin. But it's interesting, I think, that down at these levels, once again, price as hell. So um, I think, where are we trading now? Just below 7,400 at the moment. Then maybe if we can crack eight, we can have a look at the old highs up here at 10,000. But for me, the interesting thing is whenever we see it approach 6,000, we do see the bullish sentiment come out and the buyers come back out again. So I think, you know, it's another, it's another interesting one to watch to see just how far this latest run goes. Similar with Ethereum, it's a slightly different looking chart for Ethereum. But it's the same sort of thing. You can see the same sort of thing where we had these big old levels, about 300 on Ethereum hold, sells off, downtrend, breaks out, and a bit of strength this week. So, um, so Bitcoin, I think that the the immediate level 
to watch. Uh, it, it's about 8,000. You know, so 10% higher than where we are now. So um, let's see. Let's see. But any weakness back to those low 6,000s seems to bring uh, the buyers the buyers back out. Right. What should we look at next? Um, how are we doing for time? We've got 10 minutes. We're okay. Um, gold and oil. Now, the, these are also um, interesting markets. Let's do oil first of all, because because gold's been quite dramatic in the last week. Oil has um, looked a week ago as if it was stabilizing, but it sold off again. And yesterday slipped back to its its lowest level for um, about three weeks since so about the 22nd of June. What's interesting with oil, there are arguments, you can construct arguments why oil should be well above $70 uh, a barrel, uh, increased sanctions on places like Iran, etc., or also why it should be well below $60 a barrel. I think one of the things that's put the pressure on the oil price in recent weeks is, is Libya starting to produce oil again. Um, so we are, are seeing something of a tug of war, but, but what hasn't changed is uh, that big picture trend for the price of oil. Since last summer, when oil was trading about $42 a barrel, you know, it's touched 74 last month, and that big trend hasn't changed. So this is interesting. Now. I think it's always interesting think when we see moves against major trends as to whether the trend's going to hold. And the assumption has to be, for all good chartists, the assumption has to be that the trend is going to hold. So, so we've got some really big levels to look at on oil uh, in the days ahead. And later on this afternoon, we have the, the oil inventories. So every Wednesday, the US um, reveals the, the how much oil they've got in stock, basically. So we can often see Quite a bit of volatility on a Wednesday afternoon. But the big levels to watch, we've got the trend line coming in at $65. But, I've, but for me, it's these old lows from back here. Let's just uh, pick up on those levels from from there, whenever it was. There we go. So back in um, 18th of June. So ahead of 63. So let's say 63 to $65 on oil is, is arguably the zone it needs to hold for this uptrend to remain intact. So we're still a bit weak at the moment. It hasn't dropped too much today. It's been can be a bit more stable today. It's trading at what, 66, 70 at the moment. So it's a three or $4 uh, above that area, but it's going to be another interesting one to watch. And when we saw it sell off uh, about a month ago, we saw, you know, a really good move. Uh, uh, what is it? A $10 move. So nearly a 15% move off these levels. So I think it's going to be a really interesting one to keep an eye on. Uh, so for now, for me, as a good trend follower, the trend is still up. So I'll be expecting the strength to come back in. But this is another one to watch over the next few days to see what happens. We'll finish things up with gold. I have been quite surprised by, by the move in gold um, because just a week ago, maybe just over a week ago, we'd seen this, this really strong reversal off these old lows. And it's the lows from December last year, around about 12.35 an ounce uh, for gold. And we'd seen, once again, buyers come back in quite strongly. The price have a go at rallying. Okay, the, the trend was still down, but it was interesting that the RSI was also oversold. But in the last couple of days, we've seen this level just um, just get cracked, you know, and we're, and we're back now to levels not really seen uh, for a year. So we're on virtually 12-month lows for the price of gold and still falling. You know, it's making new lows again today. So I think there's there's an element definitely of, of dollar strength going on here uh, that's, that's pushing the price of gold down. So still very weak, can't hold on to rallies. And I think the interesting thing will be, okay, if it does continue to slide from here, how do we fare when we get back uh, to the 7th of July lows from last year, just ahead of 1200. So um, I think it's too early to start calling for a bounce on gold because the pressure's still on. But 1200 has been something of a big level uh, for gold. So let's see. Let's see what happens. So, so virtually everything has got something worth watching uh, in the next couple of days. I think pound to see if 130 holds. US stock markets to see if that break for the S&P ends up being um, the start of a move, having a look at fresh all-time highs. Bitcoin, because we've seen it rally the most that we've seen uh, for over a month now. Oil, because we're coming back to that trend line. And gold because it's still pretty weak, but we've got big levels uh, coming up. We'll start wrapping things up there. Um, as usual, we'll do it all again in a week's time. But to find out a bit more about Capital.com, I'll just tell you about this 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 innovation that we have within our platform that we've 
that's gone live in the last few weeks. We have um, what we're calling a bias detection algorithm. So, um, the, the, maybe the easiest way of explaining this, let's say when you're trading, some of your trades you do with stop losses, some of your trades you do without stop losses. Um, our algorithm looks at your previous trading within the platform and will maybe maybe flag up if you're showing a bias towards behaving in a certain way. And I think plenty of us know how important psychology is when it comes to trading. So it'll flag up, let's say, uh, the trades that you made with stop losses were more profitable than the trades you made without stop losses. It will highlight that and maybe push you towards an article to learn a bit more about stop losses. Or let's say you're taking on more risk and not really knowing it after losing trades. Again, it will, it will try and, and, and help you overcome that psychological bit uh, of your trading. We're going to talk a lot more about this in the months to come, but that's something we have as part and parcel of our platform that looks at how you're trading. So to find out more, open an account, try it out. Uh, Capital.com is where you go. And as I say, any questions, uh, drop me an email, david.jonescapital.com uh, and at Jones the Markets for Twitter, and I'll try and tweet out any important levels. But for this week, thanks for coming along on YouTube, Facebook, and the webinar. We'll do it all again uh, in a week's time and we'll wrap things up there.